All right. Well, Andrew, it is great to have you on the show as uh, a big fan of yours from a distance. It has been really fun watching you as you've evolved personally, as your brand has evolved, uh, obviously being in a space where I also have a brand that I'm thinking about. It's really fun watching people and watching the organic growth and just the things that um, kind of happen on their own without you just uh, it's mm -hmm. kind of like it gets on autopilot. And so you've got this really cool brand. I'd love to, I'd love to have our audience hear more about it. Well, it's good to be with you. And I hear that uh, we have some friends who are down at uh, Nomad Capitalist Live. We put on a live event. We had the former president of where I'm at now, Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili. We had Robert Kiyosaki. I know uh, you're a fan of. And oh, yeah. uh, it was a great it was a great time. And Robert was just tremendous, by the way. I mean, everybody was talking with Robert and it was really a great time. But uh, glad, glad to be with you. That's awesome. And, and just to clarify, a lot of people don't know that there is a country named Georgia, yeah. right? There's, of yeah. course, the state in the U.S., and I think most people in the U.S., uh, you know, hopefully they know that state, but I think most people in the world, specifically mm -hmm. the U.S., have no clue that there's a country called Georgia, and this country, by the way, is very friendly to entrepreneurs, has a very strong banking infrastructure. Um, there, there's just a lot of pros to it, and so I'd love to know why you're there. Why did you pick Georgia for the time being? Well, what I've spent many years of my life now doing, going in about 14 years now, is studying, researching, and doing basically what we call planting flags. This is something that Doug Casey, who also spoke at, at our event, talked about and started talking about in the late 70s, the idea that you need to be diversified. Um, if you have everything in one basket, whether it's yourself, your assets, um, your tax liabilities, I mean, you are subject to whatever the government decides to do. And what I've practiced in my life is having different homes around the world. Uh, so I'm here in one of my homes. Um, you know, getting some stuff done, getting, uh, we have a team, small part of our team here. Uh, we have, uh, you know, personal connections here. Um, I have business to do here. And so, you know, number of years ago, uh, eight years ago, came here, uh, realized the potential. It was a place that was being advertised on television. It's a place, come and invest. You know, you normally don't see governments saying, come and invest. What do they do? Well, the president originally, Mikhail Saakashvili, took this and said, we had 21 major taxes. We're going to slash it to five or six. We're going to flatten them. We're going to make it so you have to vote in tax increases. Politicians can't do it. And it became very friendly. And by the way, income that you make outside of the country is, is generally not taxable as well. And oh, by the way, if you're a freelancer and you're working remotely and you want to work here, you can pay 1% tax up to um, low six figures on your salary. Um, you can also come here on a tourist visa, 360 days a year. Um, and so, uh, you know, for me, this is the kind of country that I'm looking for. Now, no country is perfect. Um, you know, that party is no longer in power. Um, you know, and so, you know, things change. But I think that the core tenets of what makes Georgia very attractive uh, are very positive. I don't know that I want to spend my full time here, but I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, and by the way, if you're starting a business, if you're starting an investment portfolio, if you're doing something new, if you're very, very affordably with great organic food, amazing wines, I mean, it's really a great place. That's awesome. I've, I've got some friends that have spent some time there and I'm part of another investment group where really there are people located all around the globe. And uh, many of them at any given moment are in Georgia. I've just heard the greatest things. It's on my list. I definitely want to get there. Perfect. Uh, I love that Doug, Doug Casey spoke at one of your events because he is a brilliant mind and I love his books. I'm actually finishing the third of his Higher Ground series, uh, Assassin, and I love that he can take what's going on. He can write it like fiction. So, so it feels very much like a story, but he's taking narratives that are really happening and, and kind of fictionizing the feel of it for the flow. Uh, and I just love kind of reading between the lines with him because he has just such a great way to capture an audience, such a great way to tell a story. But a lot of the story you're getting is what is happening in our world today. Well, you know, this is what I've heard from people. Um, so many folks who we work with on a private basis say, I never would have been calling you five years ago, 10 years ago. You know, our motto here is go where you're treated best. Those are the five magic words. Those were spoken to me by my, by my father in the mid or late nineties, when we were talking about, you know, what I should do. I was a young person interested in becoming an entrepreneur at a very, very young age. 
And he said, listen, the writing is on the wall in this country. He was a big fan of books like The Fourth Turning. He said, this may not be the best place for you to be, whether it's this city for sure, Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States. I mean, not probably the best place. They're having a little bit of a resurgence, Ohio, but uh, not really a place where businesses are flocking to. Um, so the city, the state, maybe not the country even, he said. I mean, there may be a better place. You should go where you're treated best. And what I've discovered is there's so many opportunities in places that, as you said, like Georgia, no one's even heard of. Now, Georgia is a piece of the puzzle. I don't believe in moving everything from the U.S. to Georgia. You want to pick from the buffet. What does every country have to offer that's different? Treat it like you would treat any business in your life where you're going to, um, you know, take one of each and you're going to take the best, right? Uh, and so a lot of people now are realizing what I've been talking about in my family for almost a quarter of a century, which is your government doesn't care about you. You look at what's happening in Afghanistan, the US, the UK, others, they're leaving people behind. That's not a lot of people, but you know, I mean, if you're a US citizen and, and you, you didn't get on the plane, uh, do you feel that, that citizenship helped you? It's a much different view than people told me when I gave up my US citizenship. And what, are the helicopters gonna come in and save you from Vietnam? Well, they're not. Uh, this, this whole 18 months of the pandemic, I mean, governments have taken a lot of your freedoms. They've taken a lot of liberties. A lot of people have different opinions, but, you know, it has, people have really, I think, woken up to what's happening. And, oh, now they want to raise your taxes. Now, in places like Berlin, uh, they want to take your apartments. You're in the investment, you know, type of investment. They want to take your apartments if you have too many apartments. I mean, it's unbelievable. So I think people are really seeing that what, you know, I've been talking about, you uh, you know, publicly as nomad capitalist and thinking about before that is really happening. And I think uh, Doug has been talking about it even longer than I have. Yeah. And, and it's great to get good perspective where you listen to different people's voices, no matter where you stand on things. It's just good to hear other voices, other perspectives to make sure that you are truly investigating the truth. Uh, and so my brother served in Afghanistan with the army. He was there for a good amount of time. And he said specifically that every time their tour was supposed to end and it got extended, he said he felt like he was wondering, are they really going to come back for us? I think they are. Emotionally, I feel like they're not. And this is years ago. This is not right now. And so he was having those feelings of, being left behind while serving his country, especially in one of his tours where it was extended, you know, his, his time there was extended like three or four times. And he's like, are they extending it because they, you know, they don't have the ability to get us out? Are they extending it because there's a mistake? Are they extending it because of a loss of funding? Like wh what's going on here? And that would be a scary place to, uh, to be. But I really like what you had to say, which is go where you're treated best and where you're treated best may not be your home country. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but it's worth considering that these lines that are drawn in the sand or on the ground are really just imaginary lines, even in the US, like you, you cross a river and now you're in another state and there's a line that is drawn uh, on a map and there are coordinates to it, and it's right down the middle of the river. So what makes that so much different than the other side? Well, there are laws, there's some governing bodies, but it's just uh, kind of imaginary in so many ways. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, you know, I grew up around this. I mean, I remember, um, you know, when I was uh, about 13 years old, we moved within the same city, but the, the suburb, the, the near suburb that we were living in, uh, became more difficult to deal with. There were some issues. We wanted to get away from it. So we moved a little bit further out. We literally moved, you know, in the US, they have counties, right? So there's cities and then there's the larger county unit within a state. We literally moved. The backyard was the whole different county. The county that we were leaving with the crazy high property taxes and lots of regulations and demands, you threw a tennis ball at the back door of the new house, you would land in the old county. And so we went across this line and suddenly, you know, the costs dropped by like two thirds. Um, the regulations went down. You literally throw a tennis ball at the back door. Um, you know, when I was older, I lived in Arizona. Uh, and my first business, I was in the broadcasting business, had a very niche uh, business that, uh, you know, did pretty well. And I would drive in my early years of that business from Arizona, where I lived, over to Southern California. And you'd cross that imaginary line of the sand. And you'd think, who the hell is living in this part of California, like Blythe, California? You get none of the benefits. 
There's no women in bikinis. There's no, you know, what, what are you getting for your 14% tax or whatever it is in Blythe County? You might as well live across the border in Arizona. You might as well go up to Nevada. What are you, you know, this is not California dreaming. This place is a hole. Uh, you know, sorry to all the people in Blythe, California, but you're overpaying. And so, I mean, I've seen this time and time again. And, you know, my philosophy on people, you know, a lot of people are moving to where you're at in Austin, Texas from California, because they're saying too many regulations, too many demands, too little freedom, taxes are going through the roof. And now California wants to make it even worse. And I say, well, listen, if you're already moving up, if you're already moving, you're going to Texas. What are the reasons people say they can't move overseas? Oh, the kids have to change schools, but the kids are going to change schools going to Texas. And now one in nine Americans apparently is homeschooling because they've seen for their, in front of their very eyes just how bad the schooling is that you get uh, during this pandemic and kids were learning from home. Uh, so if you've got to take the kids out of school, if you've got to rearrange, if you've got to sell the house, and buy, if you've got to do all that, why don't you move to Puerto Rico? Why don't you go and get 4% tax rather than reducing your state tax, but keeping the federal tax? Why don't you go to Portugal? Why don't you go? I mean, there's so many tax friendly places that maybe offer you a better quality of life. And I think that people have these psychological barriers. They do have schools in Puerto Rico. They have schools in Portugal. They have schools in London, Singapore, and pretty much everywhere else. Or you can hire a tutor or you can homeschool. I mean, so... You know, what I'm trying to convince people of is these are the imaginary lines that are out there. And I think people draw imaginary lines in their mind where they're saying California to Texas. Yes. California to Florida. Yes. Uh, but go to Puerto Rico. Too weird. And I think even the people who go to Puerto Rico sometimes it's like, well, you know, that's 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 good enough. I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Any further is too uncomfortable. Why do we draw these imaginary lines for ourselves is, I think, another good question. No kidding, because it is kind of like a mental game. It's like, it's how comfortable are you? What's outside of your comfort zone? And, and really, it is, in my opinion, more of a familiarity than anything. I've heard of this. I've been there before. Uh, you know, it's all part of the U.S., for example, for those living in the U.S. And we had family, uh, my, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law and their, their kids lived uh, all over. I mean, they were in London. They were in Singapore. They were in Medellin. Um, they, they've spent time all over the globe for extended stays, five plus years in each location. And we spent a lot of time abroad. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned on my show before, I, I am pretty well traveled compared to you, maybe not. Uh, I've got, uh, I think I've been to 76 countries, whereas I'm pretty sure you're, you're well over 100 at this point. Um, and so, you know, you've got knowledge, you've got expertise. I'd love to know, because one of the things that I love the most about your brand, you know, Nomad Capital is like this whole goal and desire of having freedom. And I'm such a huge fan of personal freedoms and um, personal choice. And so I know you are, I know that that's what you stand for. I'd love to know some of your thoughts around these freedoms and, and what you're experiencing yeah. in the 100 plus countries you've been to. Well, it's been very interesting. I think there's a lot. I mean, we get known for, you know, legally reduce your taxes. That's a big topic. I think it drives a lot of people that we talk to who are the seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors. For me, initially getting out of the U.S. was I met people who were more interesting, seemed more friendly, seemed easier to get along with than uh, in Europe, for example, and then in Asia after that than I ever did in the U.S. where, you know, 40 year old women came up to me in the street and uh, insulted my scarf and I must be a, uh, a slur for this or that. Uh, I mean, just it's a weird place for me, the U.S. And so that drove me. And then I realized maybe better social opportunities, better dating opportunities. I mean, your country is probably not number one in anything. But what I also learned is freedom. And if you live in the U.S., you think, OK, we have the Constitution that protects us. I mean, how many times are they not even following that anymore? There was a case recently where um, a judge told the FBI, no, you can't go in and take everyone's safe deposit box from this private vault facility uh, just because you think a few of them are, available, uh, are engaged in the drug trade. Well, they just didn't listen. What happened? Nothing. People's stuff got taken. This is the kind of thing people talk about banana republics, and yet I store stuff all over the world. I, I have stuff in Singapore and Hong Kong and everywhere else. How many Americans are complaining about Hong Kong right now? Oh, it's China. Well, they're not coming in and taking my stuff. And so 
Now, you know, many people are not taking their stuff in the U.S. either. But the point is, I mean, what's the difference when they can do whatever they want? What I found is in other countries, you've got a lot more soft freedoms. Now, you come here to Georgia, for example, there might be a hole in the sidewalk somewhere and they're not going to put 18 cones around it and put a giant OSHA approved sign and everything else. You've got to watch out a little bit. It's truly libertarian, but they're also going to leave you alone for a lot of things. And I think right now the freest places in the world are Eastern Europe. Uh, I have a home in Serbia. I spend time there. They're wide open. Countries like Albania, wide open. North Macedonia, pretty wide open. Uh, Armenia, south of here, pretty open. Russia, if you could get in, is very open. And then parts of Central America. Look at what Mexico is doing. One of the most free places in the world right now. Colombia has reopened. Many of the Central American countries. Today, you have El Salvador adopting Bitcoin. Uh, and so, you know, these countries are practicing, now they're practicing hard freedom because they're refusing to participate in um, taking away everyone's freedoms the way that Australia has, where you can't even leave the bloody house, you can't even go to a grocery store more than five kilometers away, you can't leave your own country. It's in violation of UN and international law that you can't leave your own country. You can't even return to your own country if they don't want you now. What's the point of citizenship? And so we've seen, um, not only in my travels, but it's really been emphasized recently, you know, which countries have the most freedom. But what I've seen throughout all the years is soft freedoms. You know, are you, I got a, I had a, I sold off my, I had a couple of rental properties in the US. I got a thing as I'm trying to sell it. I get a thing, I get a mailbox service in the US. I open it, I'm in Asia. So whatever comes into the US, it's like midnight in Malaysia. I open, attention, you know, criminal violation, you know, open immediately. I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? Let me open that. Uh, you didn't cut your grass at seven inches. It should be six inches. And, uh, you know, and I call this lawyer who's helping me sell the properties. And he's like, oh, they just send these stupid things out. Like, uh, you know, they want a hundred bucks from you. I'll just go in and pay the hundred bucks and uh, that'll be all. But it's, I mean, talk about drama queens. Um, you know, you don't have that in a lot of these places. Just that kind of stupid stuff. Uh, and it's hard to quantify at times, but you feel a lot more free. And when I talk to people who are in the U.S. and they share their angst with me, I just feel like a kind of a wave of calm in many ways that I don't have to fill out all the stupid forms. I don't have to do all the complicated tax return. I don't have to do any of this stuff. So for you, actually, there are a couple of things I want to get into. Um, yeah. The first one that you mentioned was kind of this seizure of assets, and we'll call this civil asset forfeiture. And sure. for those that are unaware of what this is or that it even goes on, this is where the government deems it right to take possessions that you may have if they think that you illegally own them or uh, you obtain them in a way that maybe uh, isn't good or maybe you shouldn't have them because they're illicit, whatever it is. Um, but it's, it's basically the right of the government to take your personal belongings um, without cause uh, without due process. And then once they have them, even when you are found innocent of such crime or whatever is being blamed on you, there's this process to get them back with excessive legal fees and months to years to even get your own stuff back. Like I know people that have had a car seized because they, the, you know, the government or the authorities thought this car was being uh, you know, it, it was stolen when in fact it wasn't, or maybe that it was used to transport drugs when maybe it wasn't. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on, but this confiscation of cash happens all the time. I mean, this is one of the major income producers for a lot of these government agencies. And I'd love to hear you weigh in a little bit on that, Andrew. Well, it's very unfair. And by the way, you've come, you've seen that they come and they take the life savings of someone who owns a burrito shop because they deposit too much cash. Now look at the law they want to pass. Um, you know, they can never do their own dirty work, by the way. So they have taxes that are going nowhere but up. And uh, some small business owners don't report all their income. Now, I always reported my income and I suggest people follow the law. And if they don't like the laws, then they should go where they're treated best. But, you know, uh, now they want to spy on your bank account to know exactly how much is coming in and out. So, you, so the banks will do the job that they are incapable of doing. Um, and so, they use that kind of stuff to come and take the burrito shop owners $30,000 because people buy burritos in cash. That's a couple of years ago. Maybe they don't entirely do so today, but they do so in cash. Uh, yeah, I've seen stories and I've known people who have had problems. And, uh, you know, to me, 
I mean, what's the thing you break? How many federal laws uh, do you break every day if you live in the U.S.? I mean, one person said potentially hundreds of laws the average person breaks every day. Yeah. Um, it's just, yeah. you know, it's too much, man. And then you come to something and you say like, oh, show me your laws. They're like, oh, it's, it's like this. I mean, you would need this entire room to print out. I mean, it's just, it's too much. And they love making laws. They love making regulations. And look, by the way, this year, this is one of the things we were following around the dinner table when I was growing up. The uh, Index for Economic Freedom in the United States is now not only barely in mostly free, it's dropped to an all-time low of number 20. When I was born, when you were born, the U.S. was the number one country in the world to be born in. Now it's barely in the top 20. The economy is barely in the top 20. It's beaten by countries, including Georgia, like Chile, ex-communist countries, countries that were a mess 40 years ago. All Denmark, I mean, really? Denmark? They're like, aren't they like communists in Denmark? They're beating you. So it's just really been falling apart, but it's the frog in the boiling pot where you really don't notice it. And uh, if it doesn't happen to you, I guess you figure, well, hey, what's the problem? I can tell you there is a, there's a difference in your body, at least for me, that you feel having more freedom in other places and not having this, this whole infrastructure designed to take your money, take your stuff, make your life difficult. Yeah, without a doubt. And, you know, there's there's pros and cons to anywhere. We all know that. I love your motto of go where you're treated best. Um, now, let's kind of dissect some things a little bit because there's a lot of different strategies that you could have. Yes. So, you know, one is that, uh, and I think that based on the world that we're living in, who knows what's going to happen? Who knows how long, for example, the US is going to remain a powerhouse or the UK is going to remain a powerhouse or wh wherever you are. Like that, that can shift, that tide can change. Um, but so here are kind of like scenarios that could play out. You know, one is that you keep your residency and you get another residency somewhere else. Uh, another scenario is where you keep your residency and you just get another citizenship somewhere else. Uh, another scenario is where you completely renounce your citizenship um, in your home country and then you can become a, a citizen of another country, but you don't owe anything anymore to your home country. And, you know, U.S. is one of the two in the world that kind of follows you wherever you go, uh, that if you don't, you know, kind of renounce, they're just always going to have a piece. And when you do renounce, there's an exit tax. So I'm curious to hear how you may navigate through all these options and, and what you think, because... I do think that having a backup plan is really smart. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, some people may think I'm extreme, but I'll tell you what, if uh, things don't go the way that people plan, I'm going to be happy that I bought that insurance policy. It's the same reason I have homeowners insurance and oh, sure. car insurance. And, and I, like, I, you know, we, we see the people in the crypto, so whether we have many people we're helping that are in crypto, but you know, I'll say, Hey, uh, the price of uh, St. Lucia citizenship by investment is now two Bitcoin. They'll say, Oh, it'll be half a Bitcoin later. Well, yeah. Who knows what the U S Congress has up its sleeve to make you disclose that crypto that you've been illicitly not disclosing and paying tax on or, that they raise the tax rate or they do God knows what. I mean, they've got a lot of crazy ideas right now. We've seen in the last two years, I've seen more talk of wealth taxes, which have largely failed in Europe. Nine, I think nine out of 12 countries in Europe realize this is the dumbest thing ever. Uh, wealth tax, it doesn't work. Um, Elizabeth Warren is chuckling about how she's going to make it work. Why? Because the U.S. is the only country in the world that follows you anywhere. So even if you're an American living in Dubai, you're going to pay the wealth tax. Here's, here's why I put this together. You've got plan A and you've got plan B. And plan A is what am I going to do right away? I'm going to move overseas immediately and I'm going to either reduce my taxes to zero or if I'm an American, I'm going to reduce them substantially on my business or uh, other assets. If I have passive income and I'm an American, I'm going to move to Puerto Rico. I'm going to expatriate. I'm going to do something like that. If I'm not an American, I have a lot of flexibility. I can simply choose where I go, choose my own tax rate. So plan A is that. Plan A could be I'm going to get a second citizenship and then give up my U.S. citizenship because um, I don't agree with the country. I don't want to be connected to it. I want peace of mind. Maybe I've got a big tax bill that I would like to make that the last big tax bill that I pay. Uh, I want to get out. I want freedom. That's a plan A. These are all things that are plan A. Then there's plan B. Listen, who knows what could happen? I want an insurance policy, second citizenship. I have no plans to leave the U.S., at least for now. Or maybe I'll travel around, but I want to keep my citizenship. Get me a second passport so I have options. Just talk to a guy today. Uh, he's going to have a big tax bill because he called me about three months too late. And he wanted to leave the U.S. regardless. But the difference was he's been accumulating crypto to fund that 
he was like me. His initial thing was not about taxes. He just doesn't want to be associated with the U.S. But yet he called too late because now his, his wealth is growing too quickly. He's going to have to pay a bill on the way out uh, in all likelihood. And so, you know, plan B could have be have that second passport. So the minute you want to use it, you want to go to live in that country. There's a problem. You know, you need another passport because yours has been canceled because you didn't do God knows what. That's plan B. Plan B could also be having a residence permit in a country that you wouldn't have a citizenship. So Singapore is not going to give you a citizenship. Um, you know, Dubai is not going to give you citizenship to UAE, but you can be a resident there. And that could have tax benefits for people, especially not Americans. But, you know, that could be something you set up. I think owning real estate in a foreign country makes it a lot easier emotionally based on those lines in the sand to say, oh, yeah, we know, uh, yeah, we know Mexico. We got a house down there on the lake. Right. Yeah, we'll just go into the house. No problem. And I think that will help people avoid the I'll leave when it's too late. How many times throughout history people say I'll leave before I'll leave when it's too late. They left after it was too late. So my philosophy on this is if you're a successful person, entrepreneur or investor, it is open season for you in many Western countries. They don't want you. Look at the way they talk about you in the media. Look at how the politicians talk about you. Listen, listen, look at how just again, go to Berlin, go to Germany. The people are saying, I'm paying rent to you. Therefore, I should own your house and you should be kicked out and bankrupted. This is the way the Western world is going. They don't care about you. And so I at least want to have some properties in different places. I want to have some bank accounts in different places. I want to have a place where I can go, a home, a residence permit, which allows me to live there, and probably a citizenship, which allows me to travel. Those could be three different places, by the way, right? Or two different places. So it's plan A versus plan B. Now, Americans have a more difficult time because you're always subject to the tax code. You can move to Puerto Rico. You can move your business offshore. You can reduce your taxes to 4 or 7 or 10%, depending on your situation, your income, et cetera. There are certain types of income that are harder to move for Americans. If you're not an American, you simply leave your country, shut down what you have. There's some criteria to, fall, to, to, to fill, and you choose where you want to go. And it's that simple. Now, I happen to think that you're going to see more countries join the U.S. in the next 10 years and start implementing extraterritorial taxation. It's already being talked about in places like Canada, where they're saying, well, if you're, if you're one of us, surely you should pay, even though you don't live here, shouldn't you? So even though a Canadian may not need something as, in terms of a passport right now, I would at least look, if it not the more expensive citizenship by investment options in the Caribbean, I would look at, go to Mexico, get a residence permit, wait it out. Go other countries, you know, wait it out, get a golden visa in Europe, you know, invest some money, get on the path to a passport in the future. Um, because I think times are going to get tougher for the West. Yeah. And I mean, just to even talk about the idea of investing in foreign countries and, you know, foreign is just anything that's not your home country. Right. But let's let's look at it from the standpoint of like risk. What a great way to diversify your portfolio, to give additional options. Uh, and when I think about, you know, figuring out what a plan B would look like uh, for, you know, my family or for people that I'm, you know, in, in community with, it's, it doesn't have to be as extreme as what you hear Andrew say. Now, for some people, it is, is, is this extreme. Um, and for others, it might just be like, hey, just in case. I want to mm -hmm. do it, or I'm about to have a big payday. So let me figure out how to reduce taxes, or I'm really concerned about some of my rights being stripped. So let me have an extra plan for freedom. And uh, I just think that this is something that's worth considering because a lot of these countries, you can gain citizenship by investment. Um, you can either buy it or you can invest in real estate or invest in a fund or invest in uh, bonds that have to be held for five years or whatever, you know, the, their, you know, rules are around it. But there are a lot of options to consider. What I'd like to know is what do you think some of the better options are for residency and citizenship? You mentioned Portugal earlier, and I've read all kinds yeah. of great things about Portugal for, for both residency and citizenship. Uh, I'd love to know, you know, any that you think are great. So Portugal is a residence that becomes a citizenship if you meet certain criteria. Citizenship by investment is in the Caribbean, you're making a donation, you're buying bonds. I generally don't recommend any of the other options. There's a lot of overpriced stuff. Um, you're getting a citizenship in, if you're doing the paperwork efficiently, six, seven, eight months, something like that. Um, a program like Portugal, what they call the golden visas. Um, by the way, you don't have to come and live in a country like Georgia. We're doing an increasing amount of work with countries like Ireland, English speaking, very developed. They have interesting programs. They have tax incentives. You know, that's going to cost a lot more in terms of investment. But Ireland, Portugal, Greece, Latvia, 
have residence by investment programs where you can work towards citizenship or not. Maybe you don't want citizenship. You know, maybe again, Singapore, Dubai, Monaco, very few people become citizens of those places. Um, but, you know, I think that from a real estate perspective, I think Turkey is an undervalued one. A lot of Americans kind of, you know, uh, look askance at that. You basically can get a free passport. Now, it's not going to be free if you do it wrong. 90% um, of the inventory out there is garbage. If you go on almost any website, there's a lot of scams. There's a lot of hucksters. I mean, it's a very salesy culture. They're selling inventory that's worth 150 for 250 But if you find uh, someone who, who you know, knows the market, I bought a property in Turkey, and it's worth more than what I paid for it. Not a lot, but it's worth a little bit more. Um, you can get citizenship with a quarter of a million dollar real estate investment in a matter of months. And it's a little bit less bureaucratic than some of the Caribbean options. Countries like Colombia, very interesting. I've talked about for Americans, Mexican residents, it's right next door. You could drive there, relatively low requirements. I'm looking at agricultural land in, in, uh, in Ecuador. Um, you know, I think Eastern Europe is very interesting. Serbia, Montenegro, more difficult for residents. Georgia, I think it's gonna become a little bit easier in, in, in the near future. Um, so, you know, those are countries that I like. Asia right now is largely shut down. Thailand, a lot of people like Thailand. They have an interesting investment visa program. Many people don't talk about it. They look at the, the elite visa, but Thailand is one of the more open countries in Asia, which isn't saying much, but you know, that's a popular place where you can park some cash. So, I mean, best really determines, determines or is based on, uh, I mean, we do we do diagnostic diagnostic process with people. We will go through probably two hundred different questions and a handful of scenarios. So, I mean, best has so many endless permutations, but I think those are places to look at. Um, it depends on what you want. Are you a hundred thousand dollar freelancer who wants to pay one percent in Georgia, buy a house with one year of the money you save? That's an option. You know, other people want to go to the Cayman Islands and have a guy buying a ten million dollar house. That's a it's not the fanciest house in the Cayman Islands for $10 million. You know, he's living there tax free. Um, you know, so there's so many different options, but those are some that I'm working on right now. And, and if you think about it, Andrew, I mean, talk about someone going from 43% taxes to 1%, yeah. right? Or, you know, you could talk about Puerto Rico to 4% corporate, but probably 0% on, on most of what I would imagine a lot of people moving there you know, would be tax on, but in Georgia, 1%. I mean, you're, you're talking about eliminating the vast majority of taxes, which is incredible. Something I think is really neat about you. Um, obviously, your I mean, kind of your motto, or your ethos is kind of like become a citizen of the world, like it's the world mm -hmm. as a whole, not these, you know, different lines, but where there are lines, take advantage of the rules and regulations and opportunities. Uh, but you have 15 passports. Am I right? Or at least 15? No, I don't think I have 15. Uh, no, I've got a handful of passports. Okay. I don't talk about all of them. I've done a number of the investment programs and I've done other ones, but um, no, it's a handful. I think the record of what I've heard is like nine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But obviously you have a bunch of res residencies on top of that. So a couple, you know, sometimes yeah. the residences turn into citizenships eventually. So, uh, or sometimes you just let it go because you don't care anymore. But yeah, I mean, I have a good handful of them. I have, you know, bank accounts in probably that many countries or even more, um, you know, some of which, I mean, you know, it's like, I don't want this bank account anymore, but I don't feel like going there. So I'll just leave $7 and I've learned that's not the best one. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I believe in having assets diversified. I believe in being very well diversified. I'm not 100% crypto. I'm not 100% real estate, but I believe in all these things. And, um, you know, I, I practice what I preach, which I think more people should do. Um, that's why, you know, my, my approach to things is very holistic. If you buy that property in Turkey for citizenship, there may be certain things you need to report in your home country. If you're going to rent it out, there's probably some taxes you're going to have to pay both in the country and, and at home. Um, you know, what's the bank account that you open there to, to pay the bills? You know, how does that get dealt with in your home country? You know, where do you travel? Does that mean you keep your citizenship? Like where, if you get a residence permit, which passport do you use? I mean, this stuff all kind of works together. And I think that rather than trying to collect shiny objects, I mean, people should figure out what are they trying to accomplish? I want to reduce my taxes to 5% or less. Uh, you know, I want to have an insurance policy against the United States, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the things people should be thinking about. And um, I think it's more important than ever. Yeah. And one of the things I like that you said in your book is why not have a home on every continent? Why not just, you know, diversify that way, have places that you can go, uh, which is great. Now, you've mentioned- Maybe not Australia anymore. That place is kind of turning into a mess, but uh, every <laughs> other continent. 
There you go. Yeah, uh, it is a shame to see kind of what's happening over there. And for people that are not aware, you know, <laughs> dig in to what's going on. It, it really is sad. Oh, it was years ago. I mean, I, you know, I thought the U.S. was bad. And I remember flying through there. I was in uh, Vanuatu. I was going to Vanuatu. And, uh, you know, you come from the U.S. And, uh, you know, I, was, I, was, I used to be a little more uh, snarky than I am now. And uh, we give the TSA guys, they'd be like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'd always make them come and do the pat down. It's like, I'm not going through your machine. And, uh, you know, just kind of the, the libertarian in me was perhaps a little stronger then. And then I go to Australia and I'm like, hey, do you mind? I'm like, all right, this is not my country. I'll be nice about it. I'm like, uh, you know, do you mind if I just do the, uh, you know, the alternate thing? They're like, oh, you know, what's the alternate? Like, you can, yeah, sure. You can fly two days from now or something. Like there's no alternate. The alternate is you go home. We, you know, something happens. And then two days from now, you fly to Vanuatu. I'm like, all right, fine, I'll do it. And I just realized this is worse than the U.S. It really is worse. And there's something in the water down there. People really love it down there in Australia. I mean, I'm trying to help them as much as possible. But they, I don't know. They really like they have their brekkie place with the avo toast and they have the beach view. I don't know, man. I mean, it's, 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 it's probably the worst place on earth right now. Yeah, I would agree with that uh, totally. Now, the taxes are through the roof. I mean, yeah, whatever. Right. Right. Uh, and it's based on the signs that I'm seeing, it's just probably going to get a lot worse. A lot of people like it. I mean, that's really the thing. When you look at the Colombias, the Serbias, the Mexicos, and I'm sure someone will find one example or two examples, but these people, uh, and by the way, the book, The Fourth Turning Talks, but Eastern Europe in this way, Latin America, I mean, just people are fiery. They don't want to put up with this stuff. You look at, yeah, I mean, even people in my audience, I mean, it's the nomad capitalist. It is libertarianism. It is go where you're treated best. People in my audience, oh, come on, Andrew, you just know this is a special circumstance in Australia. They had to do it. They have to deprive people of their rights. They have to keep their own citizens out. You're just being, uh, you know, difficult. What? You can't, you can't get into your own bloody country and I'm being difficult. And that's what my audience thinks about it in some circles. Imagine what the average Australian is saying. Mm. And that's what it's all about. This is the Western world now. Now, maybe Eastern Europe or something, but maybe it was always this way, every, every man for himself. But there's this sense of community, and that's what you're paying this bill for, the 43% you mentioned, that there's a community and we stick out for each other. Don't you want to pay taxes for your fellow man? Well, wait a second. You can't get back into your country. When you're stranded somewhere, they say, screw you, or they say, oh, we'll send a private jet. Do you, do you have 100 grand? You know, uh, your fellow man doesn't care about you. What are you paying into this system for exactly? What is this alleged benefit of the community? No, it's a shaming technique they use to extract your money so they can get it. Interesting. So I'm curious with your, you know, desire for freedom and to help other people, you know, reduce taxes, gain more freedom, to be more worldly. What's your stance on cryptocurrencies? Well, as I said, I mean, we work with a lot of people from the crypto space. I have over the course of many years, we took our first Bitcoin at the end of 2013, and I wish I would have held on to, uh, to more of that. Um, it took me a while of working with people and, and of knowing people and friends who were in the space back like 2013, 14, but I did get into it. Uh, I'm not a 100% guy in anything. Um, you know, it interests me that in some perspective, someone says Bitcoin's going to be, you know, $10 million each. Well, at that point, Bitcoin will constitute, you know, whatever much greater percentage of my net worth. And, you know, that's fine. Am I going to care that I have $180 million rather than $190 million, um, you know, or 180 versus 380? No, because I, I do believe that part of what this is about is enjoying your life. And that's why I own real estate that I think makes me more productive, that I can use, that's done up the way that I want it to be done. It helps with my business, which is not only you know, a profitable thing to have and helps fuel more investments, including in crypto, uh, but it's a personal calling for me. And I think anyone who's built a business knows that. So you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in crypto. Uh, I'm not all in. I respect people who are all in. I have a lot of people who are all in. Uh, I think it does make your life more difficult in my space when, um, again, just a guy uh, earlier today, you know, he's like 95% crypto, that's going to be a lot harder to get him through the bureaucratic processes of residence and citizenship because they don't necessarily understand crypto. They want to see a bank statement, right? And so, um, I, you know, I think that's important to navigate, but uh, I think it'll, you know, I mean, look, it's, it's the results speak for themselves. Yeah. And there are 13 countries that don't tax 
uh, Bitcoin. Is that right? Or tax the capital gains? There's no uh, There's capital a handful gains of countries, tax. and some have yeah, some have different conditions. I mean, if you stay in a country, you know, Germany, for example, for now at least, you know, after a year, um, Portugal's pretty friendly. Yeah, there's a number of them that have been been friendly, um, for sure. Now, in your book, uh, you talk a lot. So you got a great book, and I've got it right here, uh, Nomad Capitalist. And you've just done a, um, you know, in addition to it, you've extended it. There's a bunch of new content. And obviously, for something like this, things are always changing. So it's great that you've got a new edition with, you know, updates and extra chapters and, and everything, which is super cool. And, uh, and that was, by the way, the thing, I mean, the book is not like the, the, the official guide of like every passport and price. I'll be updating the thing every week. Uh, it is an entree to everything that you can do to where you get the vibe, you get the perspective, you get the stories, you get some ideas, and then you take it from there. Uh, and yes, we did recently update it. The new one has my, has my picture on the front because someone says, that's what you have to do with the book is put your picture on the front. <laughs> I like it. Well, in your book, you have something called the EKG formula. Yeah. And I'd love yeah. to have you share that. Well, the idea is, you know, basically enhancing your freedom, keeping more of your wealth, and then growing what you have. And so, um, you know, freedom is important. I'll tell you this. Um, I paid very little tax legally as an American when I was a U.S. citizen. So the idea of, Andrew, you know, people renounce their citizenship for taxes I was paying, I think in the last year, literally zero. But the challenge was there's a lot of restrictions, there's a lot of regulations, there's a lot of forms to file, there's a lot of reports that are made and uh, you're subject to this and that. And you also are restricted in how you use your money. And so being able to go out and acquire more real estate to you know, enhance my lifestyle, being able to go and live in more places that enhance my freedom, uh, having a peace of mind that I wasn't going to run a foul of some form, having the peace of mind that I didn't have to be the citizen of a country that I always kind of felt weird. You know, it's like, ah, oh, here's the, here's the American. Um, that really was helping me be productive. I mean, if you look at, um, my income, my net worth since leaving, I think that the weight, there's a psychological weight that was removed that helped just, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a whole perspective change that really helped. Uh, so enhancing your freedom is very important. I think for any entrepreneur or investor, it's a good thing to have. Keeping more of what you earn is pretty straightforward. We just outlined how your country is not really giving you that much more. I don't believe that you are getting much more um, in the West. You know, talk about the diplomatic corps, for example. Uh, I had a couple of team members of mine from here, Georgian citizens, come to elsewhere in Europe for a, a training we did. The ambassador drove them to the airport afterwards and like got them onto their plane. Um, I don't think the U.S. ambassador is helping you. In fact, we had a guy lose his wallet here and, uh, and he was like, you know, something happened and he called because he needed to get something replaced. They wouldn't even answer the phone. Wow. So why are you paying 43% for that when you could live here and pay 1%? Um, what are you getting? So keep more of what you earn. Offshore companies, you know, restructuring, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then growing what you have. Now, yields are down a lot of places. And if you want to use leverage, which I don't, um, then you know the US is good for leverage, for sure, for like real estate investing. Uh, you're not going to get 95% loans in most places in the world. And interest rates aren't going to be as low in most places in the world. But you do have the potential to have much higher returns. Um, I mean, look at my portfolio this year. India has been a, 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 an outperformer. Um, Cambodia has been a very successful investment for me over the years in terms of growth, in terms of yield. Um, George has been successful. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of good deals around the world because these markets are growing. I always have the concern if I'm buying something in New York City or in Sydney or in Berlin, are they going to take my property? Are they going to increase my taxes to where it's not going to make it even feasible? Like what happened in Greece years ago with an eightfold increase in property taxes. Nobody wanted to own property. You can't sell it. They're going to restrict how you rent it out. I want to go to places where you can actually grow your money. Um, and I just don't think that's many countries in the West. Yeah, th there's so much truth to what you said. And, and earlier you had talked about this, and I've done a lot of research on this as well, just this whole optionality of having assets all over the globe, having you know, assets in foreign storage, having assets uh, that uh, you know, are, are in multiple banks around the world, different jurisdictions, because anytime something happens, like a bank can implode overnight, because even today, the, the solvency ratios are just anemic. 
uh, and, and they're not as strong as you think. Like a lot of people look at insurance companies and they think their banks are stronger than insurance companies, but an insurance company has to have, you know, a hundred percent of the money on hand at any given time. If everyone that they insured died at the same time, whereas a bank uses fractional reserve lending and there just are some kind of egregious investments that they do with a portion of those funds. And so having money in some of these foreign banks, in fact, you know, there are banks in Georgia that are some of the highest rated banks in the world uh, in terms of what they give you for, you know, your, your interest and the Absolutely. solvency ratio. And I just think that that's brilliant. Um, you know, there, there's just having exposure to gold and silver, uh, physical gold and silver, and even, you know, different locations around the globe. Uh, I'm curious your thoughts, because I mean, a Cyprus banking event can happen anywhere, and it's going to happen again in the future. I just watched a line in Afghanistan for the bank that was the longest line I've ever seen anywhere for anything like ever in my entire life. And, uh, and so I can just only imagine what could be happening there. I think that the issue again is, I have a friend from Australia many years ago said, we're taught um, you buy even in your own city in Australia, other cities, what do you know? Now, obviously there's a learning curve and like anything else you learn, you work with people like myself and the network that I built over the years, which has taken a lot of time and a lot of travel. Um, it's valuable. Uh, you can go and learn it yourself. You can go and make friends, whatever. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I, I think that um, you never know what will happen in one place. And some of the, the, the silly lines, oh, what if Russia invades? Um, sure. I mean, uh, I guess that's uh, something that has happened in the past. I think if you want to get into a deep geopolitical conversation, I don't see it happening again. People talk about what if a country takes your property? Well, I know some countries where they're already taking your property. Um, and I think that a lot of these countries have learned the lesson of stuff that didn't work. Um, communism and all that kind of stuff, whether it's Nicaragua, Serbia, anywhere else. Um, Malaysia recently came out recently. When all the Western countries are talking about wealth taxes, I said, we're not going to have a wealth tax. Uruguay came out. Um, we're not going to raise taxes. Um, again, countries like Georgia can't raise taxes. Smaller countries have to be more competitive. And so uh, I think that you know my philosophy is, again, get past the imaginary lines in your mind. And yes, if you want to go to Armenia next door and earn 5% interest on your US dollars, you can do that. Uh, now, certainly if your entire entirety of your portfolio is in crypto, then 5% may not look very good. But if you want some, you know, in fiat, you can do that. If you want to put your money in the Armenian dram, which if you look at a five-year chart is really pretty much even with a dollar, you can get 10% on that. Um, and yes, you may have um, a bit more privacy in some cases. Banking secrecy is really a thing of the past. It's not the wolf of Wall Street hiding your money in Swiss bank accounts, but a little bit more privacy. Um, you could get higher solvency ratios. And I remember living in the US uh, at the end of the last decade, or, well, at the end of the 2000s, how many banks went under? I mean, hundreds, maybe even a thousand in the yeah. couple of years. How many banks went under in Singapore? Zero. But I'll guess what? There's probably a lot of people in Singapore who are saying, I don't want to invest in the US. That seems pretty scary to me. Oh, and by the way, if you're a foreigner and you invest in the United States, there's an estate tax when you die. That's their thanks for investing in their country. Yeah, it, it is. The long arm of the law in the U.S. is quite extreme. And uh, but, 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 but just think about that for a second. George is saying you come here, you live here, you pay 1% tax. Okay. Now, again, for Americans, it's a little more complicated than that. The U.S. is saying you may have never been to our country. And I had a, I had a guy, he had almost $10 million in property. His father did. His father's 78 years old. That father passes away the way they'd structured their property. They're gonna have a huge estate tax bill. They never even been to the United States. So what kind of a comp what kind of a competitive environment is that for attracting investment? It's what I call a legacy brand. When they think that a country you've never been to and its services you've never received should tax you $3 million on something like $8 million in investments for the privilege of dying, uh, that means you're not competitive. You are living off of the fumes. You are the, uh, the Louis Vuitton of countries. Now, I like Louis Vuitton, but you know, does anybody think Louis Vuitton is the number one best value in men's footwear? No. And so if you want to have the prestige of telling your friends how you have your money parked in the US, then I guess go ahead and park it and pay the $3 million when you, when you keel over. 
but it's not really a good deal and it doesn't really speak to how the country thinks of its investors. Well, taxes are only going to go up because our debt is only going up. Our money printing is only going up. It, it, there's just no way out of it. And the irony is these increases in taxes, though they're large to the citizens, are very small. Like they can never capture uh, even close to the debt. Like they're not even capturing the interest of the debt, let alone the principal, let alone. I mean, it's just uh, they're not capturing anything because every dollar they come in, they've got a new plan for it. Right. Yeah. So, to invest, it's, it, you know, it's like I, I met a woman once. She's like, you know, I like to invest in purses. I said, that's not an investment, darling. These are your purses are not an investment. I mean, maybe it's an investment to get, you know, to, to look nice and people want to talk to you, but it's not an, your purse is not an investment. In, you know, throwing money at, at a bureaucratic uh, school system, that's not an investment. Now, sure, giving people a proper education. You want to measure which country has the best education system? I'll give you a hint. The U.S. isn't even in the top couple dozen. I mean, there people are running rings around them in other countries. And so, I mean, these politicians have all these fakakta investments that aren't even investments. It's basically, you know, a glorified form of corruption and money laundering. But, oh, you can't say the U.S. is one of the most corrupt countries. That's why it costs a billion dollars to be elected president. Yeah, there's so much truth behind your words. And the one thing I want our audience to keep in mind is you may not be thinking about leaving the U.S., but... Uh, Andrew has solutions for people that even want to stay in the U.S. For those of you who are listening and watching who are part of the U.S., for those of you that are in another country, whatever your home country is, you might not be thinking about leaving that country, but doesn't it make sense to consider all options to mitigate taxes, all options to protect your family, all options to have additional plans, additional insurance? And so, the whole idea here, though, Andrew has left and he has, you know, he, he's not part of the U.S. He's got residency and, and citizenship in, in multiple other countries. You don't have to do that to take advantage of all the great things that are happening in the countries around you. So I think that's the message. Uh, Andrew, where can our audience find out more about you? Here's where I would start. I think the book if, if you spend a few bucks, it's a good place to start because I put together a lot of stories. You know, there's some, it's a little fun. It's going to give you the, the broad strokes of all the stuff we're talking about. And you're going to be able to condense 3,000 pieces of free content into a, I guess, about a 400 page now book since we updated it. Um, that's a great place to start because you're going to really understand, again, the vibe. I tell people all the time don't get into shiny object collection. I have a St. Lucia passport. Uh, as one of my passports. That helped me accomplish numerous other things, including a year or two later, things I didn't entirely expect but thought might happen in the future. <clears throat> so I had a reason. I didn't just want to have an extra booklet around my house. Uh, so I'm against shiny object collection. You're going to get the vibe if you read the book. We have a YouTube channel, Nomad Capitalist, uh, 1,300, I think, plus videos. We have a blog on nomadcapitalist.com. You can click on articles. You can read something like 1,600 or articles or more. Um, and then ultimately, if you are a seven or eight figure entrepreneur, what does that mean? It means you make half a million dollars a year or more. You have a net worth of a million dollars or more, one or both of those. Uh, we have a holistic service that speaks to what I wish existed when I started this process 14 years ago to jam in all the results you want, to kick out the stuff you don't need, to focus on the stuff you do need, to make sure it works together uh, to support you as well as that it doesn't work together to get you in trouble. My example that I gave earlier with the property and the reporting requirements and all that. Almost nobody does this because people have their little thing that they like to sell. They want to sell you the passport. They want to sell you the company. But those things, in my experience, uh, there's always more things that you need um, to make it work. And so we create holistic plans for people. It's not a cheap process. It is a boutique process with me and a hand-trained team. Um, and that's what we do for people. And I think that if you come having gone through the free or the the free content or the book, you'll be well prepared and you'll understand why it is that I think that way. Because I've seen far too many people make the mistakes, myself included, of just going out and getting the one thing. So that's the service that we offer. But I think you, you want to educate yourself before you do that. Yeah, I think that's great. And just for perspective, um, for a family of four, what's the going right now for a, a passport 
for each member in St. Lucia. I think it's like 160,000 or something like that. They've got a couple different programs. Yeah, I almost never do St. Lucia for a family of four. You'd probably look at one of the tax-free islands like an Antigua or a St. Kitts that are from 130 to 150. What people don't realize is they do have a good amount of fees, depending on how old the kids are. They maybe have to do diligence. Everyone needs lots of documents, notarized, apostyled. I mean, there's a lot of things. Even when I did St. Lucia, uh, oh, we need your elementary school transcripts. My elementary school's closed. How do you handle that? You do an affidavit. So, I mean, I think you're looking at, um, you know, 200 grand or something for it to be done properly, all in. No one's going to give you the all in number. They're going to tell you their fee and then there's 12 other fees, but probably something like 200 grand all in. That said, that's going to be one of the fastest ways to do it. You could look at Turkey. You could go up the realm and you could look at places like Malta. Bulgaria has a program that's not talked about a lot. Um, you could look at golden visas that turn into citizenship of the future. You could check your family tree. Do I already qualify for a European citizenship? Had a guy today, was born in Mexico. That means he's a Mexican citizen. His parents didn't know that, but he was born in Mexico, kind of like the US, you're a citizen by birth. You can do the same, by the way, if you're giving birth to kids, you can go to one of these other countries that offers it and get the kids a second passport. Check your family tree. Um, there's ways you can get citizenship more slowly, put money in the bank, invest in bonds, get a passport in three years. I mean, there's so many different ways to do it. If you're running a business and you're hiring 10, 20, 50 people, there are ways you can get an attractive citizenship, not only in Turkey, Bulgaria, Portugal, other countries as well. Even one or two people sometimes qualifies for residence that turns into citizenship. So, I mean, there's like five main ways. Plus, if you're married to someone who has a different citizenship, that could be a way to do it. I mean, you want to check all these avenues. I had a guy once and he said, how much is citizenship for my family of three? I want to expatriate from the US. I said, well, hold on a second. You qualify for a citizenship in Asia for free. Why don't we get that and save you hundreds of thousands of dollars? So that's the kind of thing I would encourage people to think about. But to answer your question, a family of four, uh, probably going to look at one of the, the, the higher level citizenship programs, which prioritizes families of four over the cheaper ones, which prioritize singles. Yeah, that's great. Great feedback. And, you know, it, it sounds very expensive. It is very expensive uh, <laughs> until it comes in handy and it's the greatest investment that you made. So uh, I share all this and we bring, you know, this information to you. I have, you know, Andrew on my show because I think it's good to just consider all the alternatives, consider what it looks like to live somewhere else, consider what it looks like not even to live somewhere else, just to utilize tax advantages of some other country. And as I close all my shows, I just want to challenge you to take one step. What is the one step you can take today that gets you closer to financial freedom and living the life that you truly desire, a life by design, not by default? Thanks, and we will catch you next week.